when I was 13, I started learning to play the guitar. And I immediately faced the challenges that millions of kids must have faced before me. My fingers were too small to play the strings, too weak to press them properly. And my hands were too untrained to move from note to note. So the first one month was half-formed, unclear, painful notes that sounded bad and felt worse. But the second month, nothing much changed. But the third month, something did change. My fingers weren't hurting the same way. They were pressing on the notes a lot better and the chords were actually sounding like chords. I could play my first chord after three months of practice, which was the A chord, arguably the easiest chord to play. And after six months of practice, I could play my first bar chord. I wish I could say that I learned a big lesson that day, but I was so excited to call myself a guitarist that all I could do was look forward to college and impressing other people with my first A chord. I decided to take up biology and become a doctor, gave a couple of entrance exams, got decent ranks, did my MBBS from Grant Medical College in Mumbai and my MD medicine from KEM Hospital in Mumbai. And when I entered my residency, I faced a challenge that thousands of residents had faced before me. My medical knowledge was too less to understand the complexities of the cases in front of me. My hands were too untrained to do all the procedures that were expected of me. And my time management skills were not good enough for me to finish the tasks I had to do each day. It was like I was learning the guitar all over again, but with human lives at stake. I found myself constantly reading to update my knowledge, practicing medical procedures, and my efficiency kept getting better. After three to four months of residency, I found myself recognizing the patterns between different diseases, and I was actually finishing my work in time and getting a good night's sleep. Not every day, but some days. And subconsciously, something else was happening. I was developing a confidence that Whatever be the task, I can learn it. I was learning to learn. This got me curious about the process of learning. What happens in the brain when we learn? This led me to be interested in neurology and neuroscience. I took up my DM Neurology in SGPGI in Lucknow. And four years later, here I am talking to you about the neuroscience behind learning. So what is learning? To put it simply, learning is the intake and storage of new information and forming new connections with existing information. Learning is something we spend a lot of time on. Almost all our childhood and a significant part of our adult lives goes in the act of learning something. Whether it's a new language, a new skill, a new concept, every TED talk you listen to is giving you new information you probably didn't have. So let us look at the three aspects of learning from a neuroscience perspective. First is intake. The intake of new information requires a sensory apparatus. All the information you receive enters your brain through one of your five senses, through your touch, taste, smell, sound, and sight. When I'm talking to you, this information is reaching you through your ears, It hits your tympanic membrane and the cochlea inside your ear converts it into electric signals. These electric signals are taken up into your brain in a place called as the auditory cortex inside your temporal lobe. This is where these electric signals are decoded into information that you perceive as sounds, as words and meanings. Similarly, my expressions, my gestures reach your eyes, hit your retina where it is converted into electric signals that are sent to your visual cortex inside your occipital lobe. And again, this is where your brain understands these electric signals as images, shapes, meaningful visualizations. Similarly for touch and the somatosensory cortex and so on. This is intake of information and this is step one of learning. An important step, no doubt. The more you intake, the more you learn. But as essential as this is, I believe this is the easiest aspect of learning. The next step is putting all this information together and making sense of all your senses. 
every primary sensory cortex like the auditory cortex like the occipital cortex has a secondary association cortex which has the role of putting all the pieces of this jigsaw back together and forming a big picture this is where our brain constructs a three-dimensional view of the world around us and what we perceive as reality and this is the reality that our brain must now learn but it's not enough to just let information in that information must also be stored and this is where memory comes in memory is the glue that holds reality together memory is what links each moment to the next and gives reality the uninterrupted feeling of time passing there are different types of memory there is the immediate memory for instance if somebody gives you their phone number the amount of time you need to remember those digits to take out your phone enter those digits and store their contact is what immediate memory is along with the five other details of where and how you met because that's how all contact names are stored in the brain the immediate memory also known as the working memory is stored in the prefrontal cortex which is at the front of your brain in your frontal lobe what if you don't have your phone with you well assuming you get over your anxiety you will have to memorize it in other words learn it this is where long-term memory comes in and this is where your hippocampus which is an area deep within the temporal cortex comes into play the hippocampus has the role of storing your long-term memories and the process of converting your immediate memories into long-term memories that you will just remember is what is learning but getting something to stay on as a long-term memory is not easy most of the information that we receive is subconsciously perceived and lost we see hundreds of faces in a day at least we used to before this pandemic but most of them don't really hit our conscious perception they would barely register hover in our working memory for a second or two and then just fade away but the faces that we do remember are the faces we see every day or the faces that we see in a context which is important to us like a first date for instance in other words there are two things that decide if a piece of information will get stored on as a long term memory repetition and context so let's talk of repetition when a new piece of information enters the hippocampus one of the things that happens is formation of new synapses a synapse is the connection between two neurons which are brain cells but a new synapse is fragile and can very easily break or rather that memory can get lost unless it is strengthened repeated firing of that synapse will lead to something called as long term potentiation or ltp which is one of the fundamental building blocks of learning the synapse gets stronger and stronger which means it takes progressively less effort to fire it until you are doing it without thinking as if it is a habit this is how practice leads to habit which will become intuition you end up doing something without thinking now let's talk of context just like the saying no man is an island similarly no piece of information exists in isolation everything you know is connected to something else that you know your brain is constantly looking for patterns and every new piece of information must fit into a pre-existing pattern to be understood there are many ways of visualizing this i visualize it as a knowledge tree if i were to tell you something new like a new fact it's like handing you a new leaf of information your brain will register it and look for a place in the knowledge tree to place it a branch of other similar things to group it with if you do find something like that this new piece of information becomes a part of a larger picture and fits in and therefore it becomes easier to remember new connections start forming between neurons or new synapses and they become progressively stronger because of long term potentiation and this process is called as neuroplasticity which brings me to my first two learning to learn hacks that i use to learn better practice more 
and find better context. It also brings me to the first pitfall of learning. If a new piece of information does not fit in easily, it could lead to anxiety or fear. Our brain's need to make things fit into a pattern is so great that often we may end up making patterns prematurely just to make space for new information that doesn't fit. Or we may even modify the information itself to make it fit better. This is a form of cognitive bias that needs to be looked out for. Now, if the information you're getting is in familiar territory, your brain already knows what to do with it. The networks are in place, the patterns are already formed and you are comfortable learning this. But suppose it is unfamiliar information, a new job, a new language, a project that is outside of your comfort zone. This is an uncomfortable situation. Like an animal outside of its natural habitat, the brain reacts in a different way when forced to learn something that doesn't fit. You may have heard of the limbic system. It's an ancient part of the brain that controls emotions. One of the parts of the limbic system is an area called amygdala which gets activated whenever there is a threat. And activation of the amygdala leads to a hormone called cortisol which is a stress hormone. And cortisol has an important role to play in the formation of new synapses or neuroplasticity. In other words, stress is an important factor for learning. We think of stress as a negative thing. but Stress is also a sign that your brain is taking something seriously. If a new piece of information does not elicit any stress, like one of the hundreds of faces that we pass in the street, it might not register long enough to be converted into a long-term memory. Your amygdala activation has a key role to play in focus, motivation, and distraction. Like any student learning a new topic the day before the exam can tell you, a little bit of stress acts like a great boost for learning. But it is not something that I would recommend depending on because too much stress can very easily trigger anxiety and panic which act as a detriment to learning. So the third learning to learn hack that I use is optimizing your stress. Now this is something that is easier said than done but I've realized that it is something we all do subconsciously. We all have an idea of our own stress sweet spot where too little means you're bored and too much means you're frustrated and that optimum zone in the middle is where productivity and learning happens. And this brings me to the final part of my talk which is failure. Now the idea of failure has been ingrained in us as something to avoid. But failure is actually feedback in the loop of learning. Learning is not a linear process because our neural networks are not linear. Everything in the brain happens in circles as feedback loops, information going back and forth. So an important part of learning new information is putting that information back into the world in some form. In other words, teaching is a great way of learning. Why is it important to learn to learn? Our knowledge of the brain is still growing, but this is an important conversation to be had right from schools. Everybody learns differently. And understanding the science behind learning can help children learn better. Children with learning disability, dyslexia, ADHD, they will benefit from an early diagnosis and a greater understanding of how learning happens in the brain. The networks that are used to learn are formed in childhood, but they continue evolving in adults. I have realized that learning to learn has an exponential benefit. The more you learn, the easier it becomes to learn new things. In the last three months, I've been experimenting with learning. I've been taking up new projects, upgrading old projects and trying out these techniques to improve the outcome. Apart from my life as a doctor and a neurologist and seeing patients and learning to treat them better, I'm learning to write poetry, play the guitar, give music to poetry and make songs, shoot and edit videos. I've started a YouTube channel to explore neuroscience and normalize talking about neural networks in relation to learning, to behavior, to mental health, and to everyday experiences. I'm using this knowledge of stress and attention to improve my multitasking. I feel I'm on a journey with no end because there is always something else to learn. Usually these talks end with a conclusion, but I'm speaking to you today from the middle of my journey. So think of this as a story so far. 
I'll keep learning new things every day and try to combine them into a bigger picture. I hope you'll all do the same. Happy learning everyone.